Thank you, Kaylee, and welcome into our round table. Bill Priestley here with you. And today we're going to be talking about, um, and today we're talking about Russian oil and the prices that we may see going up uh, in the near future. And we've got a couple of people here that have a lot of knowledge about the maritime industry and what can be uh, expected coming out of this. We have, of course, Dr. Salma Cogliano, Associate Professor of History here at Campbell University over in Bowie Street, North Carolina, and our own Greg Miller, maritime writer here for FreightWaves.com. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining for joining us. Uh, let me start with uh, Greg here for just a second. Greg, uh, actually, let me start with Sal, I should say. Given uh, right now where we are with Russia and sanctions and everything that's going on right now, uh, Greg Miller's story a couple of weeks ago also talked about insurance and reinsurance. Insurance being revoked, reinsurance being denied, essentially, uh, as things come out of this. As you look at this situation, how where are we going here with this in terms of, obviously, political uh, political and trade sanctions are one thing. This is obviously another. Firms, but the insurance one is probably one of the most severe because without insurance, they're not able to move cargo. They can't get into ports. They can't go through the Suez Canal. And that's having the biggest impact on it. When the announcement was made that in May, the P&I insurance, the protection and indemnity insurance was going to be canceled for Sofcom flot, which is basically the state run tanker fleet of Russia, that was going to immobilize the Russian fleet. They weren't going to be able to get through the Turkish Straits, not maneuver and not go into ports. What Russia has done now is basically self-insured. They're using a state agency to fund their vessels to provide the insurance. It's like driving on a street. You're not allowed to drive a car unless you have insurance because of the amount of liability that you're having. Same thing with these vessels. The danger here is not that the Russians may lose a tanker and have to pay out money, but there's a potential for Russian tankers to be seized and grabbed because of restrictions on them. And the loss of one tanker loaded with 300,000 barrels of fuel is going to be an inordinate cost for Russia to have to deal with. And this is all impacting the amount of oil coming out of Russia. Now we're seeing the shift in where Russian oil is going, which we can talk about in a minute. Greg, uh, let's kind of get a timeline here of what's going on. Obviously, as we said, political and trade sanctions are, are one thing, and insurance is, is entirely another. Uh, what can you tell us about the timeline of, of this in terms of uh, insurance being denied or reinsurance, or reinsurance being denied, insurance being revoked? How is this going to play out over the course of the next few months or years with Russia? Sure. Uh, well, um, the EU law was passed on June 3rd. Uh, for seaborne crude, uh, at the end of exports is on December 5th, uh, and for refined for products on February 3rd. Um, and the insurance and reinsurance follow that same schedule. Uh, th there's a lot of complications here, though. The UK, it, for this to work, the UK, which is a major insur insurance center, has to mirror the EU policies. And it turns out that there's a lot of uh, complications that they found with doing this. So this is still in the works. But what we're really looking for is a wind down uh, towards towards the end of the year. So with that, that gives Russia perhaps alternative methods in terms of how they uh, are, are going to be moving their oil out of this. And uh, Greg, uh, you brought up uh, in, in uh, your article the idea of sort of these illicit taker, tankers or uh, shadow tankers, as other people have called them. Um, there was a newsletter that you uh, graciously gave us which defines some of these ships as having to engage in suspicious activity related to the illicit export of Iranian or Venezuelan oil over the past few years, and therefore their operators are comfortable taking niche insurance cover. Um, what can more can you tell us about these tankers if Russia decides to use these alternative forms of moving oil? Well, if you think about it right now, I mean, starting with the way the market is right now, uh, Russia is exporting more crude and products than ever, uh, and actually they're benefiting financially on the oil side from the war because the price of oil has gone up. Um, you know, if you look at the U.S. listed, uh, the public tanker companies here in New York, uh, most of them are going to shy away from loading um, the Russian crude and products simply because they have investors, it doesn't look good, but there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and there are plenty of private Greek owners right now who, who are making a lot of money 
uh, loading Russian crude and products when people, other people aren't willing to. And you could say, okay, they're doing something wrong here, but they're really, uh, you know, technically not. There, there are no sanctions on uh, these cargos right now. Uh, you know, their their you know their customer may, may be like, for example, Italy that that needs the oil, and in fact, the United States itself um, wants this oil to flow, because politically, uh, if uh, if the, the the volume is reduced, then the price goes up, and that affects us here in the United States. So the complication comes when the insurance ban comes into play, and that could could take out most of the the traditional. Uh, tanker players who uh, call in Western ports and have Western insurance. Um, there are there are other options, though. Um, you know, Russia has its own fleet, uh, Sovcom Flot, uh, which has its own insurance, uh, so they can use their own fleet. Uh, and there are also all of these vessels out there that are called the, you know, people call them illicit, but they're really just, you know, whose law is it? It's They're just not complying with U.S. sanctions and they don't do trade in U.S. dollars. They're older vessels that would normally have been scrapped. They may be self-insured. Uh, and so they've been carrying Iranian oil and Venezuelan oil. Uh, they're not going to be calling in uh, Western ports and doing business with us. Um, you know, they're not covered under our uh, uh, rate indexes. Um, so those ships are out there, and they can shift over and handle the uh, the Russian cargoes. The problem is, is that... Uh, there, there's there's not going to be enough of them. There's not going to be enough ships in the Russian fleet in this shadow fleet to handle all of Russia's cargoes, particularly on the refined product side. Uh, there's just not enough vessels there to carry the diesel and things like that. So what you could have here with the insurance is the problem is, is that this could actually, well, the intention is to reduce the flows of Russian exports and therefore hurt Russia. Um, but then you know, there's people in the United States now, the Financial Times just recently reported that, a great article that the U.S. suddenly realized the problem with this insurance situation. They're scrambling to talk to the U people and say, well, you know, slow down here. So this is all very up in the air right now, but this could have a huge effect uh, on what's going on in the tanker market, markets and what's going on with, uh, with fuel prices. So let me jump back over to Sal here very quickly, going back into this, uh, as someone said, illicit tankers uh, being used possibly here. Um, is there a risk in terms of what Russia is under undergoing here, or is this fairly safe and, and uh, can they benefit from it? Well, I mean, there was a report last week of Russian tanker out in the eastern Atlantic doing a skin-to-skin -skin transfer uh, off the Madeira Islands moving cargo. And, and this is one of the elements we're going to start seeing is that the Russians are going to be playing a shell game here, moving fuel off tankers into other tankers and, you know, outfits like Tanker Tracker and these few other ones that follow ships, not just via AIS, but through open source intelligence, through satellites, to be able to track the cargo that's moving out to determine whether or not this is Russian oil or what oil it is, is it's going to get harder and harder to do this. And we're seeing it taking place. Understand a transfer between ships is not unusual, but it's usually done at anchor in protected waters. You usually don't do it out in the Eastern Atlantic off the Madeira Islands, you know, in open ocean when the closest tug is over 500 miles away. And that's the, the extent that the Russians are going to do this. You also have to remember too, we just had the Poseidon conference down in Athens and, and six of the largest tanker owners in Greece, and Greece is the largest owner of vessels in the world, basically are sitting there saying, listen, we, we still need to be able to trade Russian oil and move oil and, 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 and use it. And Greece has been that one element within the EU that's been pushing against sanctions, pushing against the uh, uh, elements here to stop uh, the movement because they're so dependent on that oil. So you, you've got two different issues at play here. I think the Russians are going to try to move oil through clandestine means if they can. But again, they got to find a place to sell 300,000 barrels of oil a day that was going to Europe that's slowly being ticked down over time. Greg, as you look at Russia in the situation that they're in right now, what situation really does this put them in? Do they look like they're seeing some, some end results where they may have to be put in a big squeeze or are they, do they feel relatively comfortable about this in terms of what they're dealing with in terms of sanctions and insurance issues. It seems they feel relatively comfortable about it right now. Uh, they're mm -hmm. they're making a lot of money. Uh, the The volume has, I think, uh, Kepler said that the volume in May 
was down only 4.4% from pre, pre-invasion. So they seem to be doing fine with it right now. Uh, it, you know, the question is what happens, and they have time to resolve this. Uh, you know, they're, uh, you, know you, you could you know, get vessels that went out and, and get, get insurance in Asia and other places. I mean, I think the real interesting issue here, uh, looking even further out, and it really depends upon what happens with China, and we saw a little bit about this back in the trade war and some of the, you know, there was a big issue a couple of years ago with sanctions on um, a Costco tanker subsidiary because it was involved in the loading and transport of Iranian oil. Is it? It's almost like we're, you know, if we talk about these shadow fleets and the illicit fleets, it's almost like uh, we see this divergence in the global fleet almost being cut into two uh, where it's, you know, there's some commerce that's going to be done in U.S. dollars, and it's going to play by the rules of, of the Western society. And it dep- again, it depends on how things go with with China, and I think, you know, that's complicated because they need um, they need us as buyers uh, of their goods. Um, so uh, I, I don't, the difficulty there and them splitting from us is extreme, but you can see this with Russia, and you can see this with, you know, Iran and Venezuela, that there's almost a, sort of a splitting up of maritime in the future. We've never had this before, obviously, uh, at least with a, a international trade this developed. And, and there's just so many implications for, for splitting the trade world into two. I don't know what's Sal, Sal, yeah, uh, Sal, just we got about a minute left. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, you go from back from the day when the Seven Sisters ran everything and, and controlled the uh, tanker market. But I think this is part what Greg's touching on is a big thing, is that the shipping center for the world is shifting from you know Europe and, and the United States to Asia, and this is going to accelerate it. And, and the, the the issue here isn't so much that it's shifting that, is, as Greg says, it could potentially split. And, you know, the recent seizure of a uh, Russian tanker carrying Iranian oil, you know, off the waters of Greece and the retaliation by Iran grabbing two Greek tankers and, and the fact that that really hasn't been resolved yet is the potential that we're seeing. Are we going to start seeing the seizure of these tankers out on the high seas as sanctions take greater and greater hold? And that's depending on whether or not there are secure fuel sources for Europe and other countries. It, it has the potential to turn a tanker war that happened in the 80s into a global war over fuel, which is the worst case scenario. But again, what we're seeing here is the beginning of an escalation, which is what we need to be watching out for. And that's going to just increase freight rates and cause spikes in fuel costs. Well, it's definitely a situation that we're all going to have to take a good amount of observation around uh, as we move uh, forward here. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to more developments as the story continues. We will take a short break. We'll be back to wrap up this edition of Freight Waves now right after this.